Your remark further. Senator Wong, good afternoon, sir. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I don't have any questions for the esteemed chairs of appropriation nor of uh, finance, revenue, and bonding, but I wanted to give my thanks. I wanted to give my thanks to them, Senator Austin, Senator Fonfera, and the ranking members, Senator Berthel, as well as the House member, uh, Representative Nuccio, Cheeseman. I think it's important for us to, to kind of recognize the, 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 the remarkably difficult work that they had to go through this year. Sure, we're in a surplus year, and all of a sudden, everybody feels as though they need to get their past due funds for the struggle that they've endured. The chairs and the rankings have fielded so many requests, so many worthwhile requests. And I truly wanted to acknowledge them before I begin my discussion. So thank you. I want to, I want to also acknowledge the efforts of the President of the Senate, Senator Looney, Speaker of their House, Ritter, Senate Republican, Senator Kelly, Senate Democratic Leader Duff, Democratic House Leaders Rojas, and Candelora. In an unusual circumstance this year, we had an opportunity where the legislative lead majority, as well as separately House and Senate Republicans, proposed a budget with suggestions and recommendations and ideas that were reviewed, evaluated, and incorporated in some aspects of this bill. That is a step forward to what has happened in the past. As I thank the members of the legislative body in both the House and the Senate, I also want to commend Governor Lamont and his staff in helping draft the initial proposal that started the conversation in February, and for his maintaining the discipline of the guardrail that we made a commitment to in mid-January. We have passed the opportunity, we have passed the test to have the discipline to maintain the guardrails that were set, to live within our means despite the many temptations of using gimmicks, using methodologies that meet the immediate need, and as I began earlier, the worthwhile request and needs of so many of the entities. And I think this document does that. Now, is this document perfect? No. But it is an effort that reflects our priorities, at least the priorities of the, the, the proposals that were afoot. Are we going to leave people disappointed, angry, unfulfilled? Absolutely. But this reflects living within our means, respecting the guardrail. And for that, we deserve great compliment as a body. Now, I said this budget isn't perfect. I'll tell you some parts of it that isn't perfect for me. I think one of it is what has occurred so many times in past practices is the fact that we had a budget that was released at 3 a.m. yesterday. It was a budget that had 832 pages with 425 sections, some of which are policy implementers that, that explain the funding allocation, but also, in some cases, full legislative policies that may or may not have had a public hearing through the committee or the joint favorable process. But unfortunately, it is, in some cases, business as usual. 
and it is sausage making in the political process. But it also reflects what people hate about the political process. It is the power and privilege of leadership. Make no mistake about it, that policy is allowed to continue because if you have a bill in the implementer, you'll love it. But you're going to hate it if your issues are left out. Again, it's not a perfect document. For me, and my support of this budget is a first step in tackling the challenge of affordability of Connecticut residents in the state of Connecticut. We've heard from many of our colleagues some of the rationales and the struggles through our public hearings, through our interactions up and down Main Street when we're interacting with our constituents. Affordability in the state of Connecticut is a primary issue that drives our constituents. Now, there are many other issues, but affordability, due to the combination of inflation, taxation, and onerous policies on our businesses, is a constant struggle for people that want to live in a state that they love, but they can't. The people that have moved out of this state, we talk about the migration, and we talk about that kind of response and saying, you do this to me, I'm going to leave. I'm going to tell you, most of the people I talked to that made the move wish they never had to leave the great state of Connecticut. But they're forced to. They can't afford it. They can't afford it. So when we talk about affordability, the issues related to taxation, energy costs, health care costs, the disparity of income and education in our various communities, and the renewing cycle of poverty that many of our residents live in in the state of Connecticut, when we have the highest disparity and differences in income in our state, when we have the highest level of the achievement gap in the country, sometimes I struggle with recognizing what great opportunities, what great resources we have in this state. But at the same time, we sometimes turn our eyes away from the unpleasant, the struggles, and the cycle of poverty and, and challenges that we choose not to look at. What we heard earlier is that this budget lives within our means. It has one of the largest tax increases. I know people are going to have differences of opinion on the level of tax cuts, but it's a tax cut. And if nothing else, it gives relief to the residents of the state. It's a recognition that this legislative body respects and understands that Connecticut residents cannot afford to live in the state and that we have taken too much from them. But beyond the tax cuts that we talked about, we made a very, very conscious effort in the prioritization of issues that are important, I think, to all of us. And we approach it different ways, but in this case, in this bill, we put our money where our mouth is. What we have done to be able to fund education is a step forward. Is it as much as some people wanted? No. But to me, education is funding, commitment, and support to supplement great teachers, great communities, great parental engagement. The commitment to special education and the recognition during this legislative session to tackle that important issue is still a work in progress, but it does allocate funding to properly and sufficiently pay out to our respective Board of Educations and Communities the special education access to education costs. The 
The other critical issue in keeping people in this state is our retirees. Our retirees, and what we have done in the last number of years, is to create a vehicle where income tax, Social Security, and beginning next year, the IRAs for our retirees will be tax-free. But there's always a glitch. We had a cliff of 75,000 to 100,000. I'm very grateful that we have up that cliff to 100 for a single filer, to 150. I still think we need to create a, a tiering effect for the higher level income so we don't have a cliff. But it's better than nothing. And I appreciate the chair of finance and the vice chair and, and all the members for understanding and listening to the people. There are a lot of parts of this bill. We would take a lot of times, we would take a lot of engagement. It's not perfect. But I do believe it had the input and the collaboration of parties involved in trying to make our state better. So for me, I want to rise and thank all the players that made this happen. It's a bill that I can go back into the community and say it's a sign of progress. It's a sign of us recognizing that affordability is a critical element in our community. But it's also one for me as a, an American and a Republican in Connecticut that we have to understand, that we have to do our part for those that are struggling, for those that are caught by the safety net, and even for those that have fallen through the safety net, that we do have a social responsibility to support them, to give them a hand up. And I'll close by saying that the support of our nonprofits is long overdue. I'm very grateful that this budget allocated 2.5% increase to our nonprofits. When you put together for the past 15 years the lack of allocation and increases, the cost of living increases, the rise of fuel cost, our nonprofits have been running on fumes. They have been able to deliver quality services to community members that may not have been able to get those services. And they have been shortchanged. I hope that in future commitments in our budgetary process, we consider the value work of our nonprofits in our community. And if nothing else, I would also close by saying this. This budget is a good step forward. We have the luxury of a surplus to be able to do the right things. We're not going to always agree, but we also missed an opportunity here. We missed an opportunity to change government. We missed an opportunity in the times of good to be able to innovate, to be able to restructure and craft a plan of sustainability for our government moving forward. One such example is we need to re-explore the dual delivery system of our critical nonprofits versus our state services. When I recount seven years ago, there was a study that was offered by a regs review committee that said nonprofits that do comparable work to our state agencies do it at the same quality, the same standards, at nearly 50 cents on the dollar. Can you imagine if we were able to capitalize and marshal the effectiveness and the community commitment of our nonprofits to be able to have more resources, to be able to have more of their staff and allocation to take care of more of those people in need? That's a greater efficient delivery of government. I'll close by saying thank you again to all the proponents who worked so hard to make this budget a realization. I, I can't even imagine how popular you all were.
and I appreciate your diligence and prioritization and creating a document that you've worked so hard to the benefit of many people in the state. So I join in thanking you and acknowledging that I'll support this budget and I look to continue to work with you in the future to crafting the budget that we can all be proud of. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator Winfield, to be followed by